What's up, everybody? This is your boy Tech G back with another video. And we're going to be talking about the components of an operating system. So, in this video, you will learn about the various components of an operating system, such as file systems and features, file management, services, processes, drivers, utilities, and interfaces. File systems and features. So a file is a method of organizing and retrieving files from a storage medium, such as a hard drive. File systems usually consist of files separated into groups called directories. Directories contain files or additional directories. Uh, file systems can also differ in their support for data uh, compression and encryption, how file permissions are specified, whether journaling is supported, limitations on drive size and naming rules. Today, the most commonly used file systems um, today, the most commonly used file system with Windows is NTFS. Let's talk about file systems. So with any file system, one of the most important factors is cluster size, also known as allocation unit size. The cluster size represents the smallest amount of disk space that can be used to hold a file. For example, if a file occupies two kilobytes of space in memory, it will actually use a cluster when stored. If the cluster, if the cluster is four kilobytes, the file will use four kilobytes when saved to, to a disk. If the cluster size is 16 kilobytes, the file uses 16 kilobytes when saved to a disk. When files are stored, um, when files are stored, their location is recorded in their file allocation table or master file table, which acts as a type of index to the contents of the disk. The number of entries allowed in this structure, along with the cluster size, are used to determine the maximum size of a drive and the total number of files it can store. Um, so when a disk drive is set up by an operating system, it can contain one or more volumes. Each volume can be assigned a separate ID uh, in Windows, like basically it'd be called a drive letter. So here are some of the various types of file systems that you will need to understand for the IT fundamentals examination. And that will be NTFS, it will be FAT32, it will be HFS and HFS Plus, and it will be EXT4. Let's talk about uh, NTFS. So NTF, NTFS stands for New Technology File System, and it is a file organization system that stores and processes or stores and accesses information located on Microsoft Windows NT, Windows 2000, Windows XP, Windows 7 and 10. And the following are some major features of NTFS. So it, can, it has support for large hard disk drives up to 16 terabytes using the default four kilobytes uh, cluster size. It has support for journaling, which stores a record of changes to the drive. It has support for file compression and encryption. Uh, support for encryption is not present in home versions of Windows. Uh, permissions are used to control which users have access to a file or a folder and what level of access is available. And it also has support for timestamps when files and folders are created or changed um, using universal time coordinates, UTC, or also known as Greenwich Mean Time, and are displayed in local time per time zone setting in the operating system. Uh, current and recent versions of Mac and Linux can read drives that use NTFS. Third party utilities are available to enable these operating systems to write to NTFS. Reading a drive includes tasks such as opening a file and viewing the contents of a drive or directory slash folder. Writing to a drive includes tasks such as erasing a drive, formatting a drive, which replaces its, its file system, saving a file, saving changes to an existing file, and deleting or erasing a file. Let's talk about FAT32. So file allocation table uh, FAT32 is a 32-bit file system used for storage devices. And file systems um, are ways of organizing storage on devices such as hard drives, SSDs, memory sticks, micro SD cards, etc. FAT32 was the primary file system used for Older versions of Windows, such as Windows Me, Millennium Edition, and 9X, it supports drive. It supports drive sizes up to two terabytes using its default 32 kilobit cluster size. However, FAT32's cluster size changes 
according to the size of the formatted drive. So for example, a four gigabyte drive uses a four kilobyte cluster size. FAT32 also offers long file name support, enabling users to create file names longer than the eight characters plus three character file name rule used with the older FAT32 and FAT16 file systems. FAT32 does not include support for journaling. Uh, it doesn't support file compression, encryption, it, or permissions. For these reasons, FAT32 is used with USB uh, drives or memory cards up to 32 gigabits rather than for system drives. For, for flash drives and memory cards of 64 gigabits or larger, use the EX FAT or Extended File Allocation Table file system. Mac OS supports read-write access to FAT32 drives, so you can use a FAT32 drive to exchange data between Mac and Windows computers. In Windows, you can use the drive's property sheet to see the file system it uses. So in the screenshot here, we're looking at a property sheet, and as you can see where it's circled, it has FAT32 identified as the file system. Let's talk about HFS. A hierarchical file system, also known as HFS, is how drives, folders, and files are displayed on an operating system. In a hierarchical file system, the drives, folders, and files are displayed in groups, which allow the users to see only the files they're interested in seeing. The HFS file system was developed in 1985 for use with early Macintosh computers. It has a two terabyte drive limit a file size limit of two gigabytes and supports long file names. Up to 31 characters are supported by Mac OS's finder on an HFS drive. An HFS drive can only hold up to 65,535 files or folders because it uses 16-bit block addressing. Because of its capacity limitations, HFS was replaced by HFS Plus in 1998. HFS is still supported for read-only access on recent and current Mac OS uh, operating systems. HFS Plus is also known as OX10 Extended. HFS Plus supports drives up to 8 exabytes, and an HFS Plus drive can store as many as 4.2 billion files because it uses 32-bit block addressing. Mac OS has gradually added features to HFS Plus that are similar to those found in NTFS. And some of those features are journaling, which is optional in Mac OS 10.2 and standard in Mac OS 10.3 and above. Uh, permissions, standard in Mac OS 10.4 and above. Compression, standard in Mac OS 10.6 uh, .6 and above. And uh, encryption, standard in Mac OS 10.7 and above. Third-party software is available for Linux and Windows to enable read-write access to HFS Plus files. Let's talk about EXT4. So, the EXT4, or the fourth extended file system, is the current version of a journaling file system for Linux. EXT4 was introduced in 2008 with the Linux kernel 2.6.28 and is also used by Android starting with version 2.3. The largest recommended volume size is 16 trillion bytes when using 4 kilobyte blocks or allocation units. 16 trillion bytes is also the maximum file size. There is no limit on the number of folders or subdirectories on an EXT4 volume. To determine the file systems uh, for drives connected to a Linux system, what you would do, you would open up a console or a terminal session and use the command cat slash etc uh, forward slash mtab. Uh, entries beginning with forward slash dev are mounted volume. So in that screenshot highlighted in red, you can see the forward slash dev indicating a mounted drive. All right, let's talk about features such as compression. So compression is a type of data compression that works by storing compressed versions of files on the hard disk. A disk compression utility sits between the operating system and the disk drive. Whenever the operating system attempts to save a file to a disk, the utility intercepts it and compresses it. Likewise, when the operating system attempts to open a file, the disk 
uh, compression ut utility intercepts the file, decompresses it, and then passes it to the operating system. Because all applications access files through the operating system, disk compression utilities work with all applications. The entire process is transparent to the user through opening and close though opening and closing files may take a little longer. On the other hand, a disk compression utility can double the amount of disk space available. Let's talk about compression in NTFS. So in NTFS, you can compress a file with the File Explorer or the Windows Explorer by doing the following. Right-click the file, select Properties from the General tab, click Advanced, click the Empty uh, clip the empty compressed contents to save disk space box. Click OK. Click apply and then OK. A, a compressed file has two arrows pointing in opposite directions on the file icon or the file is listed in blue. Depending on the version of Windows you use, this type of compression is not compatible with other operating systems. Let's talk about compression in HFS+. Plus. HFS Plus, which is used on Mac OS 10.6 and newer, uses the Ditto command line utility with the HFS compression switch to compress a file. So this will be what the command will look like. You would type Ditto dash HFS compression, whatever the original file name is and whatever the compressed file name is going to be. Almost all the system files used in Mac OS 10.6 and above are compressed. You can use Ditto to compress data files to see information about a file compressed with Ditto. Download and use the uh, AFSC tool, which is a third party utility widely available online. Let's talk about creating archive files. So if you want to compress files for emailing uh, or for easier transporting on a thumb drive, you need to create an archive file. Here's how to create a zip file, also known as a PK zip file format with Windows or any file system from the File Explorer, Windows Explorer. So basically you would select the file or files to archive, right click the files, click send to compressed uh, folder, press enter to use the suggested name or enter a new name and you would have your file compressed. To create an archive zip file, with um, Mac OS Finder from the Finder, you will select the files to archive, open the file menu, click compress. The file is saved as archive.zip. Each subsequent archive file is numbered, like such as archive2.zip, etc. Rename the archive files as, de as desired. For Linux, you would use the gzip command tool to create zip files. That's how you create archive files in each system. Let's talk about encryption. So file encryption means providing security for files that reside on media in a stored state to prevent unauthorized users from viewing the contents of a file. Encryption is supported in the NTFS, HFS Plus, and the EXT4 file systems. To encrypt files in FAT32, you have to use a third-party utility. NTFS encryption with EFS. So NTFS uses the encrypting file system, also known as EFS, to encrypt files on business versions of Windows. To encrypt the file with NTFS, use the property sheets advanced dialog. NTFS indicates encrypted files with a padlock icon for Windows 10 or by highlighting the file in green in Windows 10 and earlier versions. The option to highlight encrypted or compressed NTF file names and color is controlled through the Change Folder and Search Options setting in the View menu for File Manager. Um, if an encrypted file is copied to another drive by the original user, it is decrypted. However, if an encrypted file is on a drive that is taken from the original user's PC and connected to another system, it cannot be opened. EFS is supported only on Windows operating systems. Encrypted files can only be opened by the original user or by the holder of a recovery key, which is a special file that is created when you first encrypt a key. If you encrypt files in Windows, be sure to make a copy of the recovery key to a USB flash drive and keep the drive in a safe 
place. So in the screenshot here, we are looking at an encrypted file and we know that it is encrypted because the file name or the folder name has been changed to the color green. Let's talk about BitLocker encryption. Uh, BitLocker is a full volume encryption feature included with Microsoft Windows version starting with Windows Vista. It is designed to protect data by providing encryption for entire volumes. By default, it uses the AES or the Advanced Encryption Standard Encryption Algorithm in Cypher blockchaining or XTS mode with a 128-bit or 256-bit uh, key. CBC or Cypher blockchaining is not used over the whole disk. It is applied to each individual sector. BitLocker was originally designed to support only the system drive or the C drive. BitLocker currently supports non-system drives. BitLocker to go also supports removable drives that use NTFS as well as FAT based file systems. BitLocker works with either systems that have a trusted platform module or a TPM version 1.2 or greater or use a USB flash drive. BitLocker credentials are used to unlock or encrypt a BitLocker drive when necessary. The user's Microsoft account online is used to store the credential information for safekeeping. A BitLocker to go reader app is available from Microsoft for Windows XP and Windows Vista. This enables a user of BitLocker encrypted flash drive or hard drive to open the drive and use its contents on an older computer. HFS plus encryption with file vault two. So starting with Mac OS 10.7 Lion, HFS Plus includes built-in encryption called File Vault 2. File Vault 2 differs from the original File Vault in OS 10 10.3 Panther by encrypting both the user's directory and the startup volume. Users can also create and then encrypt a disk image using disk utility. The recovery key, which enables the encrypted drive to be read, when the computer is not working properly, can be stored online. EXT4 encryption. Encryption with an EXT4 file system in Linux requires the users to verify the volume is compatible with encryption. Then you would enable encryption, create a folder that can be encrypted, generate an encryption key and store it, and then assign the encryption key to a folder and copy the folders, uh, copy the files to the folder. Let's talk about permissions. Permissions refer to determining which users can perform operations on a volume prepared with a given file system. Of the file systems covered on the IT fundamentals exam, FAT32 is the only one that does not support permissions. NTFS permissions. So, permissions are assigned on a per user or per group basis to a volume or a folder or a directory or a file to see change to to see or change an object's permissions right click the object select properties and click the securities tab the top of the securities window lists groups and users who have permissions to access the group select the group or user to list its permissions so this is a screenshot of a group of people our user and it lists the permissions where if you were to admin, you can go in and assign which permissions that you want this user or group to have. Let's look further into these permissions. So standard permissions are set as allow or deny and they include the following. So you have the full control permission that that allows for a user to, a user can perform any action on the object, including deletion. Modify, a user can change the object, read and execute. Users can open the file and run it. List folder contents. Users can view the folder's contents, read. Users can read the file, write. Users can save a file to the object. And special permissions. You, users can uh, edit to change how permissions are inher inherited, to view the user or group's effective permissions, and to audit permissions. So, if a user or group cannot access a volume, folder, or file, the permissions need to be edited to permit the level of access desired. 
talk about HFS permissions. So HFS plus permissions can be viewed and set up in three ways. You have Unix symbolic notation, Unix numeric notation, and finder sharing and permissions. Unix symbolic notation is as such. So you will see the letters RWX, and as the screenshot shares with you, it says the dash, which will be the first character. It shows you what type of file this is. Uh, the first three letters in red, RWX, are, are characters two through four. It will be the first group of three characters, two through four, that will represent the permissions for the file owner. The next three characters will represent the permissions for the group to which the file belongs. And the last three characters, eight through 10, represents the permissions for everybody else. This is the numeric notation. It is pretty much the same thing except written out in numbers. So R, W, and dash or whatever letter goes in, in the, uh, just put an X there or something. But basically, this is translating it into binary. So the dash will represent essentially placeholder zero. Or if it, or if it had something in there, it'll be a one. The W represents placeholder two and the R represents placeholder four. When it comes to binary, you add those numbers up and you get six. And so if you had R, W, X, it would be a seven there instead of a six. But being that we have R, W, dash, which means nothing, add the numbers up and you get a six. And then finally, we have the finder sharing and permissions. So to use the finder to view permissions, this is also called privileges in Mac OS. You would select the file or the application, click file, get info. Click sharing and permissions to view the current permissions. To add a user and select permissions, you would click the plus sign. Let's talk about ext permissions. So when you use the ls-l command to view the information, Unix symbolic notation is used to display permissions. The notation dash rw dash rw dash r dash dash translates as this. The first dash indicates the object type. Uh, the dash is a regular file. The C is a C will be a character special file or D is a directory. So you can replace the dash with a C or a D and it will tell you exactly what that is supposed to represent. The first group of three after the initial character. So RW dash, the R means user class can read the file. The W means the user class can write or change or delete files. And the dash means users, the user class cannot execute or run the file because this will be an image file. The second group of three, the RW dash essentially means the same thing. R means the group class can read. W means the group class can write. And the dash means the group class cannot execute or run the file. The third or the last group of three, uh, the R dash dash, the R means that other users can read the file. The first dash means other users cannot write. And the last dash means other users cannot execute or run the file. So when you use the, uh, the stat dash C percent a command to view file information, permissions are shown in the Unix numeric notation. So the value six, six, four, now, in some Linux distributions, they would display this value as 0664, but it translates as follows. Six means read and write for the file's owners. Uh, six, the other six, the second six means read and write for the file owner's group. And the four means read for other users' files. So these two commands here, where'd it go? Uh-oh. All right, well, I guess we're looking at the same screen. So basically, the RW dash, we already went over that, but like, like you say, that would be the, what was that one? That was the uh, notational tr uh, translation. And then the four plus two plus zero, that represents the numeric translation. Same file, just two different ways to display what the file actually stands for. And finally, um, to change permissions for a file, you would use the, 
C-H-M-O-D or the Shmod command. This command uses Unix numeric notation. To change a file from read write to read only, you would use the following command, Shmod444 and the file name .ext. Journaling. A journaling file system is a file system that keeps track of changes not yet confirmed to the file system's main part by recording the intention of such changes in a data structure known as a journal, which is usually a circular log. In the event of a system crash or power failure, such file systems can be brought back online more quickly with a lower likelihood of becoming corrupted. Uh, FAT32 and HFS do not support journaling, but NTFS, HFS Plus, and EXT4 all support journaling. Journaling is enabled by default in NTFS, HFS Plus, beginning with OX10, 10.3, and EXT4. Limitations. So different file systems have limitations on the size of a volume. The number of files in a volume and the number of files in a directory. So here are some of the limitations depending upon which file system you are using. Everything from FAT32 all the way to EXT4. All right, let's talk about naming rules. So although the file systems covered support file names longer than the 8.3 limitations of Microsoft DOS, there are still differences in the rules that govern how long a file name could be. So FAT32 file naming rules. FAT32 because it is based on FAT16, which limited file names to eight characters plus up to, up to three character extensions. So for example, wordfile.doc actually uses at least two directory entries for file names. So you would have one file like this is a word file dot doc, the actual file name. And you would have another one that this is dash one dot doc. That will be a short file name derived from the actual file name. To see both file names and short file names, also known as FSFNs with a recent or current version of Windows, open the command prompt cmd.exe navigate to a folder and use the following command dr dir space forward slash x fat32 and ntfs file naming rules so fat32 and ntfs uh support path names of up to 255 characters including the file name fat32 with 32 and ntfs treat uppercase and lowercase names as identical here are some additional points to keep in mind. You have reserved characters such as the less than and greater than, the colon, the uh, the, the uh, what is that? The parentheses, the slashes, the pipe, question mark, and asterisk. They cannot be used in a file name. However, you can put double quotes around a long file name if you are using an app that is not designed to recognize long file names. Also, device names such as ConPrint. Uh, AUX, null, and COMX, LPT, with the X equals one through nine, cannot be used as a file name. NTFS file naming rules. So NTFS supports both long and short file names by design. So the operating system does not need to generate short file names. HFS and HFS plus file naming rules. So HFS supports file names up to 31 characters. 8-bit characters except for the colon can be used. HFS and HFS plus store uppercase and lowercase characters as entered, but treats them the same when opening and using files. So for example, if a file is stored as uh, lower.txt with an L is capitalized, it can be opened by referring to lower.txt or lower.txt where the whole thing is in capital letters. HFS plus supports file names of up to 255 characters and does not have any reserved characters that cannot be used in a file name. EXT4 naming rules. So EXT4 supports case sensitive files. So for example, mark.txt where the M is capitalized and mark.txt where mark is all in caps and mark 
.txt where mark is in all lowercase are separate files in ext4. File names can be up to 255 characters. Allowed characters include the letters A through Z, numbers, periods, and underscores. Let's talk about file management. File folders or directories, file types and extensions and permissions are all essential parts of file management. Folders and directories in Windows, Mac, OS, and Linux, you can create, switch to, and delete folders in two ways. From the command line, which you will use the Windows command prompt, in the Linux and Mac, you will use the terminal, or from a file manager in the GUI, the graphic user interface. Windows folder directory command. So after opening a command prompt, you can use the following commands. So this first command, cd backslash path name backslash directory name, that will allow for you to change to any directory on the current drive. cd path name backslash directory name will allow for you to change to a directory below the current uh, directory. And if you notice the difference between these commands is the first backslash after the initial command. Then you have MD backslash directory name that will allow for you to create a new directory one level below the root directory. MD directory name will allow for you to create a new directory one level below the current directory. And RD slash backslash directory name will allow for you to remove an empty directory one level below the root directory and rd directory name will allow for you to remove an empty directory one level below the current directory linux mac folder directory command so after opening a terminal session you can use these commands so pretty much it is almost pretty much the same thing as the last screen except Instead of backslashes, we're dealing with forward slashes. And the most important part here is the first slash after the initial command, whether it's present or not, will tell you if you're going to be dealing with the current drive or the root drive or a drive below the current drive. File types and extensions. So Windows, Mac, and Linux differ in their use of file types and extensions. Windows file type and extension. So Windows is heavily dependent on file extensions like, like .docx, uh, .pdf, .jpg, etc. to determine how to handle files. A file extension that has been matched up with a file type and a default app to open it with is known as a registered file type. By default, File Explorer and Windows, in the Windows 10 version and Windows Explorer do not display registered file types. Hiding file types as the normal setting causes users who rename files to be less likely to delete or change a file extension. Many email based attacks use a fake file extension uh, such as uh, something.txt.exe to try to compromise the system with registered file extensions hidden by default. An unsuspecting user might mistake something.txt where the actual .exe would be hidden for a harmless text file rather than a potentially dangerous executable, executable file. The same dialogues can also be used to make normally hidden files and folders visible. Let's talk about Linux types and file, uh, Linux file types and extensions. So Linux recognizes seven different file types. You have the regular file directory, the character device file, the block device file, the local socket file, the name pipe, and the symbolic link. So if we go back to the numeric notation that I was talking about when it comes to Unix, and they were talking about the dash at the beginning of the, where it'd be like dash, RWX or RW dash, then the next three RWs and the next three RWs or whatever, but that very first one indicates the type, the file type that is about to be executed. So as you can see where those pictures, where those images of where we had dashes in those previous examples, that represents text, binary, image, or other files. If it had a, if it had a D in place of the dash, it would be a folder. C, it would, it would, it would be a, um, something in relation to communicating with the peripheral and on and on and on. So 
Unlike Windows, Linux makes little use of extensions. Instead, the files MIME or the MIME or the multi-purpose Internet Mail extensions uh, information is embedded into the file. And this information is used to enable Linux to choose the correct app to open a file. So we got the Windows file extensions here, .avi, .doc, and so on. It tells you what the MIME type would be and what the file type would be. Uh, Mac OS file types and extensions. So Mac OS uses file extensions when present to help determine how to open a file, but it can also use MIME types for files that have no extension. Services. Services refer to processes that are launched when a system is started or when a particular task is started. Common services include connecting the wireless network, setting up a print spooler, power management, and many others. Viewing and managing services in Microsoft Windows. So to view running services in Microsoft Windows, open the task manager and select more details. Then click the services tab. All available services are listed and each running service has a process ID number to change the status of a service number. Right click it and select start, stop or restart. You can also open the services menu or learn more about the service. Services can also be viewed and managed with the SC command line program. So this is a screenshot of the Windows task manager. You right click on whatever service like in this example where it has print spooler. And it will give you the options to either start it, stop it, or go to the process. The easiest way to manage Windows services is through the computer management console's service module. You would open it by entering services.msc in the search window and clicking services when it appears in the results. It can also be launched from the Windows admin tools folder from computer management. You will select the service to stop, start, pause, or manage its settings with properties. Viewing and managing services in Mac OS. So in Mac OS, services work much differently than in Windows. Services in Mac are managed through the Systems Preferences, Keyboard, Shortcuts tab. Then you would click Services to see available services. You can assign custom keystrokes to activate a service. And you can also enable or disable services by assigning keystrokes to a service. You can use the service more quickly. So this is a screenshot showing you various services associated with Mac. Uh, um, I meant to say something on this last slide. Oh, yeah. So to see what services are, are available, basically you would select the file, select the file or text and hold down the control key while uh, clicking it. All right. So let's move on. So when viewing and managing services in Linux. So the in the init.d or the init.d folder in Linux is used to store services. That, that will be run at startup and shut down when the system is shut down. To see the contents of the init.d and thus the startup services, you would use the ls forward slash etc forward slash init.d command, which is a Debian based, uh, a command for the Debian based distribution such as Ubuntu, or you would use the ls forward slash etc slash rc.d forward slash int, int dot D, which would be used for Red Hat based distribution such as Fedora. To list all services running or not, you would use the command service dash status dash all. The plus sign means services are running. The dash means services are not running. Question mark would mean status is unknown. To start a service, you would use the command pseudo service name pseudo service with the service name and start to stop it the same command except stop at the end and if prompted you will provide the password for the current user remember guys you don't have to be an expert you are just getting familiar with these concepts processes so 
Processes are any programs or services that are running at a particular time. Windows, Mac, and Linux all include utilities to display and manage processes. Be careful about stopping processes. Stopping a vital process could crash your system. The safest way to, to uh, practice stopping a process is to start a program you're not using and then stop it. Viewing and managing processes in Microsoft Windows. So Microsoft Windows includes the GUI-based task manager and the command line task list and task kill utilities for managing processes. Task manager can be started from the Cortana search window or by pressing the control alt delete keys and selecting task manager. Task manager starts in simple mode, listing running programs. Click more details to see a multi-tab display with processes, performance, app history, startup programs, user details, and services. To stop a process or app in either mode, you would right click it and select end task. Viewing and managing processes in Mac. So when you use a Mac, the dock at the bottom of the display shows you the apps that use the Mac OS GUI, or graphic user interface, also known as a GUI. To force a GUI app to stop, press Command plus Option plus Escape keys and choose uh, the app to stop from the Force Quit Applications dialog. After reviewing running apps, press escape if you don't want to close one. However, many other processes could be running, so use the activity monitor to view them. The activity monitor can be started from the applications menu. The activity monitor is similar to the Windows task manager and can be used to stop various processes. Uh, Mac can also use the uh, top and PS terminal command line utilities, which are also available in Linux to view processes. Viewing and managing processes in Linux. So from the Linux terminal, use the command top to see running services for the current user and root user. Press control C to stop the display. To see, op to see options for filtering and sort sorting, enter top H. Uh, let's see. Did I forget to say something on here? Yeah, I think I did. So, oh yeah. To see running apps and services, you would use the command PSAUX. This command lists the users first, followed by the PID. And the last two items are the amount of time active and the name of the service or app. To see options for PS, enter PS-help. To kill or stop a process, look up the PID or the process ID with either top or PS, then use kill or the command kill PID. Super confusing, I know, but you just got to be familiar with it. All right, let's talk about drivers. So a device driver is a computer program that operates or controls a particular type of device that is attached to a computer. For a device driver to work, the following all need to be true. The driver matches the hardware. The driver is the correct type for the operating system. The driver supports 32-bit operation for a 32-bit CPU or 64-bit operation for a 64-bit PCU. Obtaining drivers from Microsoft Windows. So drivers compatible with Microsoft Windows are provided by the hardware vendor. Although Windows includes some drivers for printers and other types of devices, these drivers are often limited in features. For the best support for your hardware, download the latest driver or use the driver's package with the device. When downloading drivers for a particular device, be sure to choose a driver that is designed for your version of Windows and processor type, 32-bit or 64-bit. Um, drivers can be updated through the device manager. To update drivers, right-click the device, select properties, click the driver tab, and click update driver. You can, search for, uh, you can search your computer and the internet or browse the computer to locate an updated driver. After the driver is updated, you might need to restart your computer. Obtaining drivers for Mac. So Apple provides drivers for hardware built into the Mac OS computers. For third-party devices, download drivers at the vendor's website. Be sure to verify that your version of Mac and your hardware are compatible with the driver. 
drivers for Linux. So there are many ways to obtain a device driver for Linux, depending on the distribution you use and your hardware vendor. Some hardware vendors host Linux drivers on their websites. However, many drivers, particularly for printers, are available as Linux packages that are available through a distributions package manager. To locate a package that contains a driver in Debian-based distributions such as Ubuntu, you would open a terminal session and use this command, sudo app.cache, then you would type search and the driver's name. Utility. So a utility or software utility is a computer system software intended to analyze, configure, monitor, or help maintain a computer. Usually a utility is smaller than a standard program in size and may be included with an operating system or installed separately. Windows utilities are typically located in one or of two places in the start menu either in the Windows Accessories or the Windows Administrative Tools. Um, here's a list of some of the most useful tools. You have the Character Map that adds characters such as icons, custom buttons, math symbols, and other, and, and, uh, and other stuff of, to a document or an image. You have the Snipping Tool. It allows you to grab any part of the screen and save to a file. Computer Management. You can configure services, disk drives, etc. Disk cleanup allows you to remove unneeded files. Event viewer, you can see warnings, errors, device installation, etc. System configuration, you can change boot process settings, startup programs and services run at start at startup. Memory diagnostic, you can test system memory. Mac OS utilities are located in the applications utilities folder. Some of the most useful utilities include activity monitor. You can display processes, CPU, memory, energy, disk, and network usage. You can also stop processes and run diagnostics. You have the, the console where you can um, log system activity. Uh, the disk utility, it displays information about connected drives, also prepares drives for use, and repairs disk problems. System information displays information about your computer, connected hardware, Install software and the network and the terminal. You can use it to run command line utilities. Linux utilities. So you have Ubuntu and other distributions that use the genome desktop store utilities in the applications utilities folder. Some of the most useful utilities include the following. The archive manager works with compressed archive files. Backup backs up selected folders to, to local or online locations. Disk Usage Analyzer provides split screen view of file usage. Image Viewer, you can view images. Screenshot, capture windows, selected areas in full screen. Task Scheduling. So task scheduling is one of the most important functions in any operating system. In Microsoft Windows, use Task Scheduler to run an app at startup or when particular events take place. Mac OS uses the automator to run app services, folder actions, and other types of activities. Uh, Linux distributions typically run the CRON or the C-R-O-N daemon automatically at startup. A daemon is a service. The CRON or the C-R-O-N performs tasks as directed by the CRON tab file. The cron tab is a plain text file that is edited from a console or a terminal session to add the commands desired. To start the editing process, use the command sudo cron tab dash e. If prompted, choose an editor, a text editor. Interfaces. So Windows, Mac, and Linux all support two interfaces. You have the console command lines and the graphical user interface or the GUI. Console command line. So Microsoft Windows uses the command line, also known as the command prompt, primarily for technical management tasks. To open a command line session, uh, open cmd.exe. However, to use cmd.exe to make changes to your system, run cmd.exe as an admin. Mac OS, like Windows, uses a terminal session for advanced configuration options not available from the GUI, most but not all Mac OS terminal commands are similar to those in Linux because Mac and Linux are both based on Unix. 
Some Linux distros boot directly to the Linux console using the terminal app. Others boot to the GUI, such as the genome. However, Linux, all, Linux uses the console mode for most management operations. To make changes to the Linux environment, most distros require the current user to add sudo at the start of the command. Sudo allows a user to run apps that normally require an administrator, and users may be prompted to enter their passwords. And finally, we talk about the GUI or the graphic user interface. So Windows and Mac boot to their GUI environments as standard. Some Linux distros include a GUI and boot to the GUI. Common Linux GUIs include Plasma Desktop, which is developed by KDE, and Genome, which is developed by the uh, GNU or the new project. Woo, that was a lot of stuff to read and talk about, huh? I know y'all are probably like, man, what is this guy talking about? Understand, ladies and gentlemen, this is the IT Fundamentals Certification Exam, which means this is the most elementary exam that you can take. The whole purpose is to get you familiar with these concepts so that as you move up the certification chain to get higher and more advanced certifications, these some of these terms will not be foreign to you. You would have some type of understanding of what they're talking about when somebody says gooey. You, you wouldn't be looking like a deer is stuck in headlights or a deer caught up in the headlights like, what does a gooey stand for? You would know that it stands for a graphic user interface. You would know that it is referring to when you turn on your computer and you start moving your mouse around, clicking on icons, clicking on pictures and doing things here and there. That is the gooey. All right, so let's do some check on learning. So the first question is, you need to prepare a drive for use, a drive for use with Windows 10 and Mac OS. Which of the following file systems is the best choice? Would it be EXT4, OS 10 Extended, NTFS, or FAT32, you need to prepare a drive for use with Windows 10 and Mac OS. The correct answer would be FAT32. FAT32, ladies and gentlemen, FAT32. Let me rewind up to my screen here so I can give you the information pertaining to FAT32. In case y'all are like, why FAT32 and not NTFS? Uh, let's see. Man, it's a whole bunch of stuff I got to read, so I'm going to let you guys go read it at my website. <laughs> anyway, no, for real talk, go to my website, Technology G. I have it up. I have it written out there as to exactly why. I'm not going to reread all that stuff again. I'm just not. Sorry. All right, next question. Task manager indicates that an app is not working. Which of the following is your next step? Would you start task kill to close the app? Would you open the cron tab and disable the service? Would you stop the app? Or would you edit the app's properties? So task manager, in the case that an app is not working, which of the following is your next step? Correct answer would be stop the app. You would stop the app. Final question. A Microsoft Windows user who needs to run a command line utility will use which of the following? Command line. Would it be command.com? Would it be cmd.exe? Would it be terminal? Or would it be Archie? The correct answer would be cmd.exe. That will allow for you to run uh, the command line utility by typing in cmd.exe into the search bar on your Microsoft Windows. All right. So that is pretty much our class. So in summary, we have talked about components of an operating system. We have talked about everything from file systems that should say file, not L file, file systems, file management, services, processes, drivers, utilities, and interfaces. I know this was a lot of stuff I went over in this class, and I know you're probably all confused and your mind's just all, all over the place. That's fine. That's cool. Remember, like I said, and I'll keep saying this every video if I have to, you are not expected to be subject matter experts with this, this certification. This certification is designed to get you familiar with the concepts. So as you move up 
in a in your pursuit of higher level certifications, you won't be blindsided by stuff that you, you've never heard of. At least you will have heard of it and have a somewhat of a general understanding or a bird's eye view understanding of what this stuff is kind of talking about. That's what I really want to drive home with this stuff. But for more information, so you can get read up on this if you want to go back and reread this stuff yourself. It is all on my website, technologyg.com. So you can go there and get the latest and greatest and get your comprehension skills up so that you can successfully pass your CompTIA IT Fundamentals certification exam. And until next video, ladies and gentlemen, peace.